Good afternoon. Yes, I will um, say something about uh, uh, empathy and imagination as an introduction to this uh, important uh, subject. I will not go into the subject matter uh, of uh, neuroscience, naturally, because I'm not an expert in it, although I have been recently uh, participating in conversations around the world with uh, neuroscientists. I have entitled my, my lecture, Empathic and Embodied Imagination, Intuiting Life and Experience in Architecture. Contemporary architecture has often been accused of emotional coldness, exclusive and restrictive aesthetics, and a distance from life. This criticism suggests that we architects have uh, adopted formalist attitudes instead of tuning our buildings to the realities of life and human mind. In all honesty, don't we usually design our houses on the basis of uh, functional and aesthetic criteria instead of imagining them as resonant settings and backgrounds for situations of life? Or instead of intuiting the behavioral and mental interactions between spaces and their occupants. Let us assume a wall, what takes place behind it? This is a polemical question by a poet, a French poet, Jean Tardieu. Uh, this makes me uh, present a, a further question. Do we architects think about what happens behind the walls that we design. The weak, uh, weakness of the sense of life in our uh, buildings may not only be result, a result uh, uh, of, of uh, a deliberate emotive distance or formalist rejection of life's complexities and nuances, but simply geometric configurations uh, may be easier to imagine than the shapeless and dynamic acts of life. I realize now that I have a uh, somewhat wrong um, memory stick here, but let's try to deal with these. <laughs> Joseph Brodsky, the poet, makes a blunt suggestion to this effect when he writes, the city of memory uh, is empty because for an imagination it is easier to conjure architecture than human beings. No doubt, modernism at large, its theory, education, as well as practice, has focused more on form and aesthetic criteria than the interaction between built form and life, especially our mental, mental life. Le Corbusier. Uh, Le Corbusier's famous credo, architecture is the mastery, correct, and magnificent play of masses brought together in light, turned architecture into a visually autonomous art form, regardless of his uh, formalist credo, Le Corbusier, as we know, uh, created projects that 
are forcefully emotional. And here, evidently, the poet and uh, artist takes over the polemicist and theorist. Yet, architectural form is humanly meaningful only when it is experienced in resonance with life. Uh, read, um, real, remembered, or imagined. The minimalist style of uh, the past couple of decades has tended to distance architecture even further from events of life. Again, I need to add that I believe in the value of reduction myself, but it has to be a reduction towards the essentials. Constantin Brancusi's Brancusi reminds us of this requirement forcefully when he writes, the work must give immediately at once the shock of life, the sensation of breathing. <coughs> I'm calling for an architectural thinking that incorporates life in all its complex, uh, practical and mental implications beyond the Vitruvian <coughs> trinity of utilitas, firmitas, venustas. The reductive attitude to life denies its essential spontaneity and messiness and ren uh, tends to turn life itself into a formal and predictable uh, behavior. Yet, as John Ruskin concluded, imperfection is in some way essential to all that we know of life. It is a sign of life in a mortal body, that is to say, of a state of process and change. Nothing that lives, is, or can be rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part nascent. And in all things that live, there are certain irregularities and deficiencies, which are not only signs of life, but sources of uh, beauty. As I began my studies in architecture at the Helsinki University of Technology in the late 1950s, Professor Aulis Blomstedt, who was the counterpole uh, of Alvar Aalto in the Finnish post-war architectural scene, uh, taught us the talent of imagining human situations is more important for an architect than the gift of fantasizing space. I was a bit uh, puzzled by this, uh, this uh, advice because uh, we young minds were so st uh, strongly and forcefully oriented towards aestheticization uh, of architecture. Indeed, qualities of physical space, behavior, and mental tuning are interrelated. And when designing physical spaces, we are also designing or Im uh, implicitly specifying disti distinct experiences, emotions, and mental states. In fact, as architects, we are operating in the human brain and nervous system as much as in the world of matter and physical construction. I dare to make this statement as science has established that environments uh, change our brains and those changes uh, then change our behavior. The connections between the mind and the physical setting is just uh, is much more fundamental than we have 
believed. Already in the 1960s, as many will remember, uh, psychologists observed that the behavior of an individual differed, differs more in different settings than the behavior of different individual individuals in one single uh, envir environment. And that is why they introduced the notion of uh, situational personality. Today, we know that environments give rise to permanent changes in our brains and neural system. In his book, Survival Through Design, um, Richard Neutra, already professed in, the 19, in 1954, uh, the following. Today, design may exert a far-reaching influence on the nervous make, um, makeup of generations. Architectural spaces are not just lifeless stages for our activities. They guide, choreograph, and stimulate actions, interests, and moods, or in the negative, uh, negative case, they stifle and prohibit them. Even more importantly, they give our everyday experiences of being specific perceptual frames and horizons of understanding. Every space, place, and situation is tuned in a specific way, and it projects atmospheres which promote distinct moods and feelings. We live in a resonance with our world, and architecture mediates and maintains that very resonance. two imaginations. Buildings are <coughs> products of imagination. Every human structure has first existed uh, as an intentional mental image. Isn't it rather depressing to realize that all the ugliness in our surroundings is a consequence of human intentionality and thought? In my view, there are two qualities, qualitative levels of imagination. One that projects formal and geometric images, and another one that also stimulates the actual uh, sensory, <coughs> emotive, and mental encounter with the projected entity. The first category of imagination projects the material object in isolation. The second as a lived and experienced reality in our life world. In the first case, the imaginatively projected object remains as an external image outside of the experiencing and sensing self. Whereas, in the latter case, it becomes part of our ex experiential experience, our ex existential experience, as in the real encounter with material reality. The neurological affinity between what is perceived and what is imagined has been well established in scientific studies, so I will not say more about this issue. The formal imagination is primarily engaged with topological or geometric facts, whereas the emphatic imagination evokes embodied <coughs> and more, uh, emotive experiences, qualities, and moods. Maurice Merleau-Ponty in introduced the 
uh, evocative notion of the flesh of the world to uh, denote the lived reality in which we dwell. And the empathic, imag empathic imagination evokes multisensory, uh, integrated, and lived experiences in this very flesh. Creative imagination. Henry Moore, the master sculptor, gives a vivid description of the simultaneous embodied ex internalization and Im imaginative externalization, externalizing power of artistic imagination as he writes. This is what the sculptor must do. He must strive continually to think of and use form in its full spatial com uh, completeness. He gets the solid shape, as it were, inside his head. He thinks of it, whatever its size, as if holding it completely enclosed in the hollow of his hand. He mentally visualizes a complex form from all round itself. He knows while he looks at one side what the other side is like. He identifies himself with its center of gravity, its mass, its weight. He realizes its volume and the space that the shape uh, displaces in the air. This precise account of a great artist suggests that the act of imagining spaces and objects is not solely a visual projective endeavor. It is a process of embodiment, identification, and feeling the entity as an imaginary extension of one's self through embodied simulation. The artist's body uh, becomes the work, and simultaneously the work becomes an ex extension of his body. Every creative person works unconsciously with her himself as much as with materials, forms, sounds, or words. Einstein's famous confession of his visual and muscular thinking in his work on mathematical and, and physical problems is an authoritative suggestion that all thinking has a component of embodiment. Imagination is not a quasi-visual projection. We imagine through our entire embodied existence. Through imagination, we expand our realm of being. Thinking is actually a way of molding one's world as, as if it were sculptor's clay. Heidegger, in fact, compared thinking with cabinet making. The artist's work with the artist works with a concentration of his whole personality and a conscious part of it resolves conflicts, organizes memories and prevents him from trying to walk in two directions at the same time. And Rimor concludes. The in intellect provides the ground and, uh, and control for the process, but the poetic image does that not arise from reason alone. Designing experiences. I wish to argue that true qualities of architecture are not formal or geometric, intellectual or even aesthetic. They are existential and poetic, embodied and emotive experiences which connect us with the deep human historicity of occupying space. And they are, uh, and they arise 
from our existential encounter with the world rather than mere vision. Artistic images are not pure formal configurations. They are images that are embedded in the soil of human historicity, memory, and imagination. Alvarado suggested that architecture and its details derive in some way from biology. No wonder Zemir Zeki, uh, a neurobiologist, suggests the possibility of a theory of aesthetics that is biologically grounded, biologically based. I must say that I'm personally very interested in this possibility of finding biological ground for, for beauty, to say it uh, you know, bluntly. Architectural uh, images evoke recollections, feelings, and associations. Existentially meaningful architectural images cannot be mere formal fabrications or inventions as they are bound to echo our mental world and artistic experiences are thus essentially exchanges. We, we experience them as uh, part of our life world and give them their meanings. I think this is possibly one of the uh, most crucial mistakes in today's design world is that uh, we have begun to believe that we can invent meaning. Absolutely not. Architectural qualities are constituted in the act of experiencing the world. As philosopher John Dewey argued, a work uh, or works of art in general in art and uh, art as experience, he writes, by common consent, the Parthenon is a great work of art, yet it has aesthetic standing only as the work becomes an experience for a human being. Art is always the product in experience of an interaction of human beings with their environment. <coughs> the value of artistic works is that they are experientially and emotively real. Artistic works are not symbols or metaphors of something else. They are an authentic experiential reality themselves. Here's, I think, uh, uh, another fundamental mistake is to uh, believe too much in symbolization. All art, in fact, exists simultaneously in two realms, that of physical, mat physical matter and ex execution, and that of mental imagery. <coughs> A painting is painted on canvas, but at the same time, it is an image and narrative in the imaginative mental realm. Sculpture is similarly a piece of stone uh, and a mental image, and a building likewise, a utilitarian structure and a mental suggestion. And spatial met metaphor of human existence. This dual essence and double focus is fundamental to the mental impact of art. Experiencing an artistic image seems to create a momentary short circuit between our cognitive and emotive uh, orientations. We do not usually recognize that we are actually uh, uh, that we actually dwell in architectural metaphors uh, poeti uh, or poetized images 
which provide specific frames and horizons for experiencing and understanding our life situation. Besides works of art and architecture, alter our perceptions of the world. We come not to see the work of art, but the world according to the work, as Merleau-Ponty suggests. This is another uh, central uh, idea. Uh, works of art uh, change our view of the world. And that's why we come to look at the, uh, these works, uh, not the works themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I will stop here because of the, my uh, the time limit.